Well, welcome everyone to Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar for this week. Um, my name is uh, Dr John Dawson. I'm branch head of community safety and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, before I do that, let me just provide an acknowledgement of country. So Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce this morning's speaker, Dr Gareth Davies, and his presentation is Tsunami Inundation Hazards from Global Earthquake Sources Towards High Resolution Large Area Maps with Quantified Uncertainties. I think as you all uh, may be aware, Australia's coastline is exposed to tsunamis generated by large subduction earthquakes in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Uh, and while recent events have had limited impacts in Australia, future earthquakes could uh, direct much larger waves to our coastline. With only a few hours uh, between earthquake detection and tsunami arrival, prior planning is necessary to guide uh, emergency response. To this end, there's a need uh, for an understanding of tsunami hazards, which coastal areas might be inundated, how deep and how likely. And Gareth's talk will discuss recent progress in tsunami inundation hazard assessment at Geoscience Australia, where we adopt a probabilistic approach to the problem, which involves modelling hypothetical earthquake tsunamis from major Indian and Pacific Ocean sources, their effects on shore, and their uncertain chance of occurrence. To illuminate the science, he will uh, outline uh, one, how well tsunami models can simulate historic tsunamis, two, representations of hypothetical tsunamis and their natural variability, and three, new techniques to compute onshore hazards while accounting for uncertain earthquake frequencies. Um, a little bit about Gareth. Uh, Gareth is a tsunami hazard scientist at Geoscience Australia. Since joining GA in 2010, he has worked on a variety of projects related to coastal hazards. Prior to joining GA, uh, Gareth uh, completed a PhD in Earth Sciences at the University of Wollongong. As an undergraduate, he discovered mathematics and geography at the University of uh, uh, Melbourne. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Gareth to the podium. Thank you, Gareth. Cheers, John. Thanks. Alrighty, I will just share my screen. So, Tsunami 101. Okay, so tsunamis are waves generated by a rapid large area ocean displacement. So, the kind of sources that we can do this are things like earthquakes, landslides, volcanoes, or atmospheric pressure fronts. And so this animation here, which um, let me know if you still can't see it, um, is uh, depicting a tsunami um, very similar to the 2011 Japan tsunami, which was generated by an earthquake. So the way that earthquakes generate tsunamis is basically, uh, so earthquakes occur as sort of um, uh, slip on fault planes, which are buried underneath the earth. So uh, on the right here, you see like a representation of the, a massive fault uh, on the subduction zone that's uh, near Japan. And you see sort of yellow and red colored areas representing the slip. And so basically the thing about earthquakes is when they don't just cause movement on the fault, but they also cause um, uplift and subsidence in surrounding areas. You've probably heard of earthquakes um, causing one of those uh, at, at various times. And if that happens underneath the ocean, then it's basically lifting up or dropping down the ocean. So you get this big gravitational um, disturbance that is what generates your wave. So you can see from the animation here that, you know, the tsunamis have quite complicated interactions with the coast. And just because of the dynamics themselves, um, we're not just talking about a single wave here. We're talking about a whole series of waves that propagate out through the ocean and eventually die down due to friction. Okay, so tsunamis, um, they can be generated by other things. Uh, an interesting example from this year was the volcano tsunami that was generated uh, near Tonga. So that um, had a couple of mechanisms. Basically, there was a big volcanic explosion and that caused a, an atmospheric pressure perturbation um, that traveled out all throughout the world, traveling at the speed of sound. And you can see that sort of depicted in the top panel there with the, the red and blue. Um, so that atmospheric pressure perturbation um, uh, applied a force to the ocean. And that um, generated um, part of this tsunami, something that, that was observed globally. 
So if you look at the bottom, you can see um, this sort of uh, atmospheric pressure wave expanding outwards from the source. So that, that's around the outer edge of the waves we see here. You can also see in the interior another set of waves that are a lot rougher than what we get from the atmospheric pressure front. And that's actually caused by sort of local um, mass movements or the explosion right at the volcano itself. So not the traveling pressure front, but maybe a, a landslide or the, the, the collapse of part of the volcano. Um, yeah, so, so there's a whole bunch of mechanisms that can do these things. So historically, earthquakes are the most common source. Uh, if we look down at the bottom left, we see a map of historical earthquake sources. And so you can see that um, most of the points on this map are orange, so they correspond to earthquake sources. And you can see that they're mostly clustered um, around certain of these uh, plate tectonic boundaries. So the, the plate tectonic boundaries are depicted as the lines in this uh, figure on the bottom left. So th they're not uh, occurring on sort of all plate tectonic boundaries, but they tend to be focused on convergent boundaries. So this is where one plate is um, subducting underneath another. So these are the zones where you get like the largest earthquakes and the most earthquakes. And they also um, are places where we tend to create volcanoes. And you could also get more sort of landsliding in these areas because of all the tectonic activity tends to make unstable topography. So the, the predominance of earthquakes historically also extends if you just look at Australia. Um, we see that in the Australian tsunami database, for example. Um, but it's worth noting that when you look in longer history, unknown sources are also pretty common. So this is where people would have seen a wave, but uh, not quite sure how it occurred. And so these sort of things, they're a little bit less likely to be earthquakes because often like the shaking will mean that someone will have detected an earthquake somewhere. Um, but they may well reflect sort of an underrepresentation of things like meteor tsunamis and local landslides and whatnot. So, so it's good to be aware of that when uh, thinking about uh, tsunami sources. Okay, so why are tsunamis hazardous? Well, the, the key thing is that as the water shallows, they slow down and they amplify. So as they propagate into the coast. Um, often they're not very um, large in the deep ocean, um, but they do travel very quickly. So say in a typical uh, ocean depth of around four kilometers, they're traveling at about 700 kilometers an hour. Um, so uh, that more or less means you can, you know, traverse the Pacific Ocean in a bit less than a day, something like that. So that would say going from Chile to Japan or something, you know, via a long, a long route. Um, what you see here then on the um, right is a couple of uh, illustrations of the time that it would take a earthquake generated tsunami from some location to reach parts of Australia. So in the top there, we see uh, uh, something from the Poisiga Trench south of New Zealand, which would take about two hours to reach Hobart, or to, or to reach Tasmania rather. Um, then uh, on the bottom right there, we see an example of an event from South America. And so that's going to take longer, but it's still 15 hours in this case for at least the first waves to reach Australia. So this um, is really important because it controls the warning times that we have for earthquake tsunamis. Basically, we'll know something could be happening if a um, earthquake is detected. And then we've got, uh, you know, only a few hours to, to act on that. So I mentioned about the tsunami amplification, a sort of useful heuristic for that is say, if the, the wave travels from depths of four kilometers to 10 meters, you might amplify by about a factor of four and a half or something. So you, you do get the, the wave squeezing up and, and getting larger amplitude closer to the coast due to, to energy conservation. But that's a very rough approximation. What, what actually happens when you get to the coast is that the tsunamis are really strongly affected by the coastal topography. And so as a result of that, the waves can vary over quite short distances, both in terms of their size and, and their period, which is like how many waves you have in a, in a given time period, and also currents. So these examples here are from the 1960 Chile tsunami, um, and which was observed uh, in Eastern Australia. And so here we're looking at sort of the greater Sydney region. Um, so if you look at the bottom, there's those two tide gauge plots. That's showing actual observations at Cronulla and then at Fort Denison. And so you can see that, you know, d although these are in sort of neighboring estuaries, there's significant differences in the tsunami size. So we're seeing it larger at Cronulla, smaller at Fort Denison, and also in, in the wave periods. 
So tsunamis uh, are also sort of famous for inducing um, quite fast currents or unexpectedly fast currents, let's say. And so that can take the form of just, um, you know, fast currents in places that might normally be fast during a, a, a fast tide or a spring tide rather. But they could also be um, uh, like eddies, say, you know, um, whirlpools forming and then traveling around in the flow. And so these things can be quite damaging. A lot of um, damage to coastal infrastructure historically has been caused by, by those sort of unusual currents. Okay, so um, uh, you know, a, a good thing about being in Australia is that we're not sitting right on top of these um, subduction zone uh, earthquake sources. And so then it's natural to wonder about, you know, uh, are tsunamis actually dangerous for Australia? So certainly um, if you look historically at tsunamis or think about the physics, you see that they are typically more dangerous close to the earthquake. So um, basically uh, as the wave um, travels away from the source, it, the energy spreads out to some degree and that tends to reduce the wave sizes. But what you can also see is that the waves are highly directional. So here we see two simulations from the Chile 1960 tsunami in the top and Sumatra 2004 in the bottom. And so these are showing the, um, the maximum wave size. So you can see great directionality in this. And if you look at the Chile 1960 tsunami, okay, so it probably killed a few thousand people right at Chile, but it also killed 142 people as far away as Japan, you know, so 17,000 kilometers from the source and 61 in Hawaii at about 11,000 kilometers. For Sumatra, we had about 300 deaths in Somalia. Okay, so the, this tsunami directivity uh, can make waves be very dangerous. On the other hand, um, in WA for the Sumatra event, the waves weren't especially well, um, the, the earthquake rather wasn't especially well oriented to direct waves to WA. So in that case, we largely got what's called marine hazards. So there were dozens of ocean rescues following this event. There were boats sunk and like minor inundation in a bunch of places, but we didn't see the impacts like uh, were observed in Somalia because, the, um, because of the tsunami directivity. Uh, here's another famous example. Um, this is the most deadly tsunami in US history. It was caused by a magnitude 8.6 earthquake. Okay, so not that large compared to some of the things I showed earlier, but led to 167 deaths in Hawaii at about 4,000 kilometers away and waves exceeding 10 meters at a whole bunch of sites in French Polynesia. So this again really highlights the, the effect of tsunami directivity. Okay, so let's um, think a bit about uh, the tsunami history in Australia. If we look at the West Coast, um, in addition to the, the 2004 event that I mentioned earlier, we see a bunch of sort of moderate sized earthquakes with strong tsunami directivity in the um, north, uh, yeah, in, in the northern part of WA. So in 1977, there was a magnitude 8.3 earthquake off Sumbawa. And this led to a, a generated a tsunami and led to six meter waves observed at Cape Levesque and four and a half meter waves at Point Sampson, Port Sampson rather. So there's various reports from this of shipping hazards in ports. So for example, a, a tugboat broke its mooring lines uh, in one of the ports up there. But thankfully this event arrived near low tide and so that reduced the impacts. In 1994, there was a magnitude 7.8 earthquake off East Java in Indonesia. And this led to about 300 meters of inundation uh, near Onslow and Exmouth. And in 2006, there was a, a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake in a sort of nearby area. This um, inundated campsites at a place called Steep Point, which is kind of near Shark Bay. Um, so sort of the, the westernmost extent of WA. Um, so this arrived near low tide, um, but people report flow depths varying, going up to about two meters, uh, trashed their campsites, um, moved a vehicle about 10 meters. And in a nearby area, the run up, um, so the, the, where the tsunami reached above the mean sea level, uh, reached 7.5 meters. And so this is actually the, the largest known historical run up in Australia. Um, which is impressive, you know, because the earthquake magnitude is not that big, but it was just a, a tsunami with good directivity. All right, so what about on the East Coast? Well, um, there's an interesting history of sort of marine hazards and minor inundation, let's say. So there's been multiple earthquake tsunamis from South America, 
um, that had been observed on the East Coast. So in 1868, there was something big, maybe around magnitude nine, um, that occurred off Peru. And in Tasmania, we've got reports of inundation at multiple sites and uh, a destruction of a jetty at Port Arthur. There's a really interesting old newspaper report that mentions, um, you know, convict, convicts um, uh, loading logs and then uh, fleeing and the, the jetties destroyed and old logs that were embedded in the um, sea were picked up and thrown inland, all this sort of stuff. And so in New South Wales and Southeast Queensland, there's also loads of reports from this events of marine hazards. In 1877, there was another one a bit further south. It's not really clear what the magnitude was. Um, it's not so extensively reported in Eastern Australia, but the one report I did find says that it was actually bigger in Fort Denison in Sydney Harbour, that is. So it's a bit hard to know what to think of that. Um, then in 1960, we had the, the uh, magnitude 9.5 Chile tsunami, so one I, I showed earlier. And again, that was probably a bit smaller than the 1868 event it would seem. Now, obviously in 2022, we had a very interesting event. We had the volcanic tsunami from Tonga. And so that um, generated waves that were, were widely observed in New South Wales, Tasmania, Southeast Queensland. And basically the size was like, depending where you were, approaching plus one meter above the sea level. So this was significant actually, because that's getting toward the sort of level where um, emergency managers would consider issuing land warnings. And so that did happen for some offshore islands for Australia, but um, it didn't happen on the mainland, but um, they were sweating a little bit about that. Um, so thankfully the largest waves occurred overnight. And um, uh, one of the really interesting records is at Crowdy Head, where basically we saw um, uh, waves with 12 minute period of about 1.8 meters. So coming in and out every 12 minutes. So that's like a, a spring tide range say in the area, but that goes in and out every 12 hours, you know? So must've been very significant currents from this event. All right. so. You know, interesting history, but uh, the impacts have been limited. So are larger waves likely? Well, one way you could do this is by just putting large earthquakes in unfortunate locations. So places that are well directed to send, uh, well suited to direct tsunami waves to Australia. Here's a couple of possible examples on and for the West Coast and the East Coast. So a tricky thing is that it's uncertain really how big earthquakes can be in these regions. So historically we see events sort of um, in the low magnitude eights during the instrumental period, but uh, th these are areas with big, uh, big faults and that are converging quite quickly. And so expert opinions suggest that we, we might get values up to the mid magnitude nines, right? But very uncertain, um, all sorts of different opinions about that. And so this is one way we could generate big events and we could also do it with other things like landslides, bigger volcanic eruptions, et cetera, that I'm, I'm not gonna talk about so much today. Okay, so we've got these plausible mechanisms. It's also worth noting that there's kind of tentative evidence of something going on in sedimentary records. So if you look at Western Australia, uh, there's been some research around Dampier looking at marine deposits. And basically you got evidence in that area of multiple inundation events up to 12 meters. Um, so interpretation here is not straightforward. You know, there's other things that can cause inundation like storm surges um, and, you know, various possible tsunami sources, um, big earthquakes, landslides, etc. cetera. Um, but certainly evidence that, that something's going on up there. If we look in Eastern Australia, um, there's this sort of uh, growing evidence of something really big happening on the Kermadec Tonga Trench in about the um, 15th century. Um, so basically a whole bunch of paleo tsunami deposits that look like they are, are occurring around the same time. And that in includes one in Batemans Bay in a place called, um, uh, what is it, Old Punt Bay, I think. Um, so yeah, th the interpretation of these things, you know, is not without its challenges, but there is some suggestion that we're getting big events. Okay, so now I'm just gonna to touch a bit on the tsunami science for risk management. Um, so the sort of things that GA is involved in. Okay, so basically there's two general strategies that you can do to uh, proceed with to enhance community safety from tsunamis. You can do tsunami detection and warning. Okay, so it's like if an event happens, um, let the public know and, and get people and infrastructure out of the way. 
And then you can also do tsunami hazard assessment, okay? So basically um, helping to plan where you might place infrastructure and also helping to plan about how you might respond in the event that you only have a couple of hours, you know, which areas are important to, um, to evacuate, say, things like that. Okay, so on this tsunami detection and warning front, um, we work with the Bureau of Meteorology on the Joint Australian Tsunami Warning Centre. And basically this provides warnings for earthquake generated tsunamis and can provide warnings for other tsunamis on a best effort basis, but not always because the sources might not be detected. Um, so if you just have a local landslide or something, we might not know until the, the wave arrives at the coast. So GA's role in the JTWC is like earthquake detection. And so uh, we do this using our global seismometer network and then estimating the earthquake properties. So where it is, what its magnitude is, et cetera. So we then pass this information onto the Bureau of Meteorology and they model the tsunami and the uh, develop some threat level categories for different parts of the coast. So the way this works is they take the input of the earthquake, they try to get sea level observations because earthquakes alone um, are basically not enough. The knowledge of the magnitude and location, it's not enough to totally characterize what the wave would be. So you wanna check with sea levels uh, as well. And then they um, combine this with a pre-computed scenario database to basically um, define different uh, levels of threat in different coastal zones that you can see in the figure there. Uh, and so basically you'll either get a, a marine warning or a land warning or, or maybe a, a no threat, you know. And then they broadcast this and communicate with emergency services as the event evolves. Okay, so we also do things on tsunami hazard assessment. Uh, so in this case, we're thinking about, you know, what's the chance of inundation and marine hazards? How big, how often, and then very much how certain, okay, we can be given that, you know, we, we're not really sure um, how, uh, to what, it, how big the earthquakes can be. And, and then if they do occur, how often they might occur. So one product that we have here is an offshore probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment. Okay, so um, uh, when I, I'll often use the acronym PTHA and I'm talking about probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment there. So this is basically a large database of earthquakes, tsunami scenarios and frequencies. So like uh, several hundred thousand. And what it does is it tries to represent tsunamis in a way that accounts for the source variability and also the uncertainties in how often um, scenarios can occur. And that's had substantial testing. So this is a few years ago now, but we did a lot of work checking against historical tsunamis at deep ocean gauges and long-term earthquake records. And so you can learn more about that uh, by following up on the links here. We also do inundation modeling. So with inundation modeling, there's two kinds of things that you might wanna do. Uh, you might just wanna run a few scenarios, say, um, you know, some particular hypothetical event and look at where, where it gets wet. And so that um, is something that can be useful in various contexts. For example, if you wanna do an emergency management exercise based on the scenario. It's a bit limited though, in the sense that it, um, it doesn't give you a mechanism to sort of consistently uh, compare the hazard in different areas or make sort of you know, uniform decisions about how conservative you should be. Because for an individual scenario, it might be big in one place and smaller in another. And then for another scenario, maybe the opposite would be true, right? So if you're just using a, a couple of scenarios, you have some trouble then with sort of uh, getting consistency in the, in the onshore results. So because of that, we also do probabilistic inundation hazard assessment. And so that's really about saying, how often will my site be inundated? And then we can divide related products like evacuation maps that I'll, I'll talk about later on. Okay, so for the remainder of this talk, I'm um, gonna um, discuss some of the science that underlies our applied hazard modeling. And so there'll be uh, three points to this if I um, don't run out of time. So first of all, I'll talk a bit about hydrodynamic modeling of tsunamis. Okay, so how we do it and um, model performance against observations. I'll also talk a bit about uh, tests at Australian tide gauges, okay, which obviously I'm particularly interested in um, thinking about tsunami hazard in Australia. Um, then I'll move on a bit to talking about how we can make scenarios for hazard assessment. 
So this is actually not obvious. The reason is that we're generally modeling hypothetical scenarios, right? And so there's no test data. It's not as though we can say, yeah, my, my model's working well because it agrees with observations. So we need something else and some other justification for how we generate scenarios. And so at GA, we've developed this technique of multi-event testing of random hazard scenarios that, that can give some of that justification and identify good and bad ways to generate hypothetical scenarios. And then I'll talk a bit about how we go from like offshore PTHAs where we've got all these variable sources and uncertain frequencies and take that onshore while still accounting for all the source variability and uncertainty and frequencies. So we actually have rigorous techniques to, to do this, um, which um, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on at the end. All right, so starting here at hydrodynamic modeling of tsunamis from earthquakes. Okay, so tsunami hydrodynamics for large earthquakes. So basically we know that uplift and subsidence from the earthquake is what disturbs the ocean. And so that, that leads to a non-uniform water surface, which then makes waves because of gravity acting on the water and then inertia, you know, once water starts flowing, it doesn't just want to stop. And then over time, this will decay through friction, okay, but, but a lot of waves in the meantime. So uh, from observations and the physics, um, because earthquakes uh, that generate significant tsunamis, they tend to be fairly large. We end up with horizontal wavelengths um, in the deep ocean of sort of tens to hundreds of kilometers. Um, but then because of the tsunami slowing down and amplifying at the coast, that is, you know, maybe turning into tens of meters down to, to kilometers. So very wide range of scales. Um, so then th that makes some challenges for modeling. We need our models to cover this very wide range of scales. And also at the coast, our results, they might be sensitive to details of the elevation. So in general, we, we need uh, accurate and high resolution elevation data at the coast, which is not always so easy to come by. Uh, so here I'm just showing a zoom of this same model, which is going a bit closer to the island. And in this case, so our, our model is resolving uh, scales ranging from sort of, uh, well, it, ha it has a cell size rather ranging from about two and a bit kilometers in the, in the very deep ocean and going down to about four meters in some of the most highly resolved areas there. So very wide range of scales that we, we want to capture. Um, but a nice thing about tsunamis is that we can largely represent the flow with two-dimensional hydrodynamics, especially from earthquakes, okay? This is less true for other kinds of tsunami sources, which make um, a, a bit smaller displacements often. And so that's, um, that, that's a great boost in efficiency. And that's very important at the moment for allowing us to cover, you know, a very large range of scales. Okay, so here I'm just going to show you an animation for this 1993 Okashiri Island tsunami. This is a famous test problem. So on the left there, you're seeing um, the uh, evolution of the wave at the larger scale. And then on the right, you can see where we've resolved a really particular little piece of Okashiri Island. And um, uh, you can see the tsunami dynamics there. So basically the initial wave here, um, uh, propagates in towards the island and leads to very strong run up uh, at this particular site we've resolved well. Um, and it also leads to a lot of run up elsewhere around the island, which is not depicted here. But you can see the complicated wave dynamics that are, are predicted by the model. And uh, you know, uh, those kind of things are, are what we observe. We don't have detailed measurements of the, of the waves at this particular site, other than the run up that I'll show you now. So basically here I'm zooming out a little bit more and we're looking at the, the Okashiri Island. So um, sort of in one of the, uh, some of the interior boxes of the model. And here um, we can see orange lines around the edge of the model that predict, uh, that show what the modeled run up from this earthquake source, okay? And then you see various um, lines that are other colors, uh, black or red or green. And these show the observations um, from post-tsunami surveys uh, that were taken after the event. And so you can see that um, in many respects, the model does a, a good job of predicting the run-up. It doesn't always do that. And there are, there are actually issues with some of these measurements too and disagreements between uh, different groups and whatnot. But regardless, um, uh, we do get a, a pretty good representation of, of what happened there. And so 
the area that I showed the detailed animation of before, that's actually here in Monai. And that's famous because um, we had this really localized 30 meter run up in an area where, you know, uh, even nearby the tsunami was only half the size. And that is, that's captured pretty well in this model. And uh, that observation inspired an experiment back in 2001 where people actually tried to simulate this in a wave tank. Um, so this is also a, a famous tsunami benchmark problem. Basically what they did is um, uh, developed a geometry like this little area of Okashiri Island and tried all sorts of different waves um, uh, forcings and, and checked out whether they could you know, reproduce uh, locally high run up just in this particular area and um, turns out they could. And nowadays, uh, this is also widely used as a benchmark problem for models, um, which yeah can can reproduce all these things quite well also. Um, so yeah, we have many other benchmark problems, and I can there's a link there if you want to explore these. Um, but now I'm going to move a bit closer to home and look at um, some models of uh, tsunamis in Australia. So here we're going to look at the Indian Ocean tsunami, so 2004 and how, um, what it did in Southwest Western Australia. So to do this, I've got like a, a, a model that's sort of almost global scale, well actually Indian Ocean scale, um, down to inundation scale of about 10 meters uh, or 11 meters in uh, the Greater Perth area. So this is from uh, two rocks to Mandurah, if, if you know that, that way. And so basically it does this again, using these nested grids and resolving all these different scales. So if we, we took that model and then we input an earthquake source uh, uh, for the event based on some published uh, representation by Fuji and Sataki. And so their source, uh, their representation of this was fit to data like near where the earthquake happened. It wasn't fit to data in WA. But on the right there, you can see a, a comparison of the modeled tsunami waves um, with the observations. And so for the observations, we've removed the tides here. And basically you can see that, you know, in many ways the model uh, reproduces quite well the kind of behavior that we've observed. It's not perfect, but we're capturing all the variations in tsunami size that occur, um, depending on just, you know, where you are in the coast, how sheltered it is or how good it is at amplifying the waves. Um, and also, um, even if we, we zoom in a bit and now we, um, you know, we, we plot the sites where it was small on a different scale so that we can see them. We, um, we represent the waves um, in sites that are both small and large with, you know, comparable accuracy. Um, so th this is uh, kind of what we might expect from a, a good performing tsunami model when compared with historical data. Okay, so um, here's another one for Sumatra 2005. And again, it, it works quite well. So, one um, thing that affects tsunami models is that even if we're looking at historic events, the sources are not perfectly known. So here are like two different sources uh, for the Chile 1960 tsunami. So they're both um, approximating data that were observed and thereby constraining what happened. But um, uh, you'll get slightly different modeled results from these, which you can see here. And if we go through to um, take that and simulate inundation, uh, in, or si sorry, simulate coastal waves in New South Wales. Uh, here are a bunch of comparisons of models and data. So on the top there, we see the observations in black and the model at Fort Denison in Sydney Harbour and in the bottom at Granola. So I, I mentioned those sites earlier. And yeah, again, if we jump between these two sources, you can see that they're kind of similar, but uh, one is a bit larger than the other basically. And, you know, you can sort of debate about where, which one does a better job. Uh, it, it sort of depends where you are and what you're looking at. But um, yeah, this is the sort of variation we see, even when the source is, is fairly well known. Okay, and here's another one for Tohoku. Again, sort of similar kinds of results there. You know, there is some sensitivity, different size, but it broadly it's consistent with the sort of observations we see. <laughs> 
Okay, so we've done some uh, somewhat more um, systematic work on this. So a couple of years ago, we published a paper looking at five historical tsunamis and, and 12 different tsunami sources for them that were derived from the scientific literature. So um, in all this stuff, we're not tuning the source to reproduce observations in Australia. We're just taking sources that weren't designed to reproduce Australian observations and then running them and seeing what we get. And so we compared these models with 16 tide gauges in WA, Victoria and New South Wales. And so we asked then, you know, there's a lot of questions you can ask about this. One is just how well do um, models simulate observed tsunami size at tide gauges in Australia? So there's various ways you can think about tsunami size. One is like the range of the max range of the water level or just the maximum water level. Okay, after you've removed tides so that you're focusing on the tsunami. And so the performance varies, but in general, it's pretty good. Uh, we get a typical absolute error of about 20%. So like, you know, half the time it's better than 20% and half the time it's worse. So this is pretty good compared to if we look internationally where people are doing similar studies. And also there, there's no obvious biases, okay? So we don't have a, a big preference for having higher waves or smaller waves, but individual source inversions can have biases. Um, so what else we learned is that um, it's pretty common that you find that for a given historical event, some sources will consistently predict larger waves than others. And so that's like what we saw before where um, here again, showing that example from Chile where one produced waves that were a bit larger than the other. So it turns out that um, this is often related to the source's initial available potential energy. So basically a measure of the energy that was um, added to the ocean from the, that earthquake uh, vertical displacement. And so generally, if you get larger energy, you get larger waves when the locations are otherwise similar. And that's really nice because um, it means we can actually guess relative wave heights from scenarios just by using the initial energy. So um, that's the, the nice thing is maybe it's expensive to simulate the tsunamis, but computing the initial energy is really cheap. So, you know, if we're trying to screen scenarios or think about which things might be larger or smaller, this can give us a cheap way to have a good guess. It doesn't always work, but it, it works enough to be quite useful. And yeah, that, we see the same thing for the Tohoku event. Okay. so. Key points about hydrodynamic modeling are really, we're using the 2D shallow water equations with nested grids. And so this will often be sensitive to elevation data accuracy at the coast, but at least when we have decent data, we can often do pretty well. So we predict these waves from the initial uh, earth displacement, uh, and that's imperfectly known in general for historical events, but can be constrained from data. So in terms of modeling historic tsunamis at Australian tide gauges, um, you know, typically we're talking about errors on the order of 20% in tsunami size, maybe less, maybe more, that's like typical. And that's when using these published source inversions and we're not tuning them to reproduce the data. But it'll vary with different inverted sources and often in a way that depends on the uh, available potential energy in the source. Okay, so um, this is good and um, so now I'm going to move on to another piece of science here, which is really about how we make scenarios for tsunami hazard assessment, again, from earthquakes. Alrighty. So the key challenge here is that scenarios for hazard assessment, they're usually hypothetical, or at least some of them are. And so why is that? So giant earthquakes, they're rare globally, right? So in the last hundred years, maybe we had four events with magnitude clearly above nine for earthquakes. And so because these really giant earthquakes are rare, that means on any particular source zone, like interesting scenarios from a hazard assessment perspective, they, they often have return periods, you know, on the order of thousand years or, or more even, um, depending. Um, and so that means that, you know, we probably haven't observed these sort of events. Historical records are comparatively short in most cases. And so we don't normally expect history alone to reflect sort of the largest tsunamis that are of interest for risk management purposes. Now, we can also look at sedimentary records and I, I mentioned earlier some very interesting work related to that. That's really important 
but it's also it tends to be it's very incomplete and we know that even when tsunamis happen sometimes sedimentary archives don't actually capture them you know things can be eroded or whatever uh, and there's often interpretation challenges in terms of um, what generated a particular deposit so because of that there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, the big scenarios and so Nowadays, hazard assessments, they'll usually include some hypothetical scenarios that exceed the largest known events. Um, so uh, that's been, you know, that's been common for a long time, but I, I think is even more common now because um, in 2011, the Japan tsunami, um, uh, hazard assessments that were done prior to this event, they famously underestimated how big the magnitude would be. Okay, so um, we're, we're a bit too confident in our ability to say how big these things could be. And also some of the um, uh, sedimentary data wasn't so well integrated. So big underestimation, um, yeah. All right, so generally um, uh, from a hazard view, again, we, we might be interested in, you know, how often different scenarios might occur. And typically the way this is done for earthquakes is um, relating it to the magnitude and maybe position on the fault and all this sort of thing with a, a bunch of uncertainty. So what that tends to mean for, is for hazard assessment is we, we wanna be making scenarios with specified magnitude and location and then relying on some other analyses to, to pull out estimates of frequency and uncertainty. So, one of the challenges with that is that there's actually great variability in tsunami size for a given earthquake magnitude. So um, huge, right? So more than a factor of 10. Um, some earthquakes, they're just better at making tsunamis than others. Um, so this is some older work by Geist down here on the bottom right showing big scatter and note that's a logarithmic scale in the vertical, right? So uh, very big variations there. Um, and so a big question is then, how can we generate hypothetical scenarios that reflect this? So um, in our uh, offshore hazard assessment, we tried three different approaches to this. So um, the traditional approach is um, something I called like fixed area uniform slip or traditional uniform slip. And basically that's where you assume that the rupture area of the earthquake is some function of the magnitude that's a, like a deterministic function. And then that the slip is just constant over the fault. And so you get things that look like this in terms of the, the slip and the ocean displacement. But if you actually look at data for earthquakes, you can see that even for a given magnitude, they vary a lot in the rupture area. So here's an example of a simulation that tries to reflect that. Okay, so we're seeing some events that are very compact and some events that are very broad. And this is, this is ballpark the scatter that you see when people look at um, multiple historical events. So again, here we're assuming that slip is constant for this model, but actually real earthquakes have heterogeneous slip and we can try to represent that. Um, uh, again, there's various techniques of this. This is based on some stuff we published back in 2015. But really the core thing is, you know, how can we test these from a tsunami perspective, right? They haven't happened. Um, all right, so one approach to this, which we've used heavily is called multi-event testing of random scenario models. And so what the idea here is, is you wanna look at multiple historical events. So here we've got like 18 historical earthquakes um, in the figure uh, up here. And basically for each of those, you wanna um, take your random scenario models and consider all scenarios that have similar earthquake location and magnitude in some specific sense to actual observed events, okay? So you don't wanna tune them to the event, you wanna randomly simulate and uh, make a, a sort of a, a random set of your model with similar location and magnitude. And then you get a whole bunch of different tsunamis that you sort of see in the animation here compared with data in blue for, for Tohoku in this case, the Japan tsunami. And so some of those will be big and some of those will be small. Some might look like observations, some won't. And so you can ask yourself then for multiple events, do some scenarios produce tsunamis like we observed? And then are there statistical biases in the wave heights? Okay, do we, do we get too many small scenarios or, you know? So for that particular question, we need to test against multiple events. It's not enough to just look at one event because maybe that one event was a fortunately large tsunami, let's say, or you know, fortunately small. So this, this gives us a way to test random scenarios. And so previously we published some deep ocean tests of this. 
Um, here's uh, some example for the Chihoku tsunami again. And so if we ask ourselves, do some scenarios produce tsunamis like what we observed? Um, when looking not just at Tohoku, but over many events, we find that uh, some of the model, one of those models that we tested, it really doesn't work well, but the other two do, or much better anyway, and, and about, about equally well produce waves that look like events we've observed when you're doing this random simulation. We can also ask, are there statistical biases in the scenario wave heights? And so basically we did identify biases for the, the simplest model. And um, our more complex models um, could be bias corrected uh, and then perform quite well. The, the heterogeneous slip model actually didn't really need much bias correction. But the, the other one that had a uniform slip but varying rupture side, size, it tended to make tsunamis that were too small, but we could then reweight it and tell it, oh, focus more on the compact events. And then, then the bias went away. So I think there's a couple of ways you can simulate these random scenarios. Um, uh, but um, it is easy to make bias as well. So, so this is great. This is how we justified the scenarios used in the, the 2018 offshore PTHA. And so, but then, you know, that, that's all based on deep ocean waves. And the reason for that is because it's way less expensive to compute, you know, many hundreds of times, let's say. Uh, but, you know, obviously we care about waves of the coast as well. And so more recently, I've been studying the properties of random scenarios with similar location and magnitude to, to historic events at Australian tide gauges. Okay, and so that's, that's good because it means we can look at more historical events before the deep ocean gauges were widespread. And, um, and because we really care about coastal behavior. So that's in progress, but basically we're finding results that are pretty similar to, to what we would expect from offshore. So we often find random scenarios that look similar to observed tsunamis, that one of the models fails, the same one that we would have expected based on the offshore results. And we see downward bias in one of the models. Again, we would have expected that from the offshore results and we see pretty good performance in the other kinds of source models. Okay, so, so that's really cool. And so the key points here are that we've got, you know, we've got hypothetical scenarios in hazard assessments. We want to represent the tsunami variability and this multi-event testing gives us a way to try and do that. Okie dokie. So um, the final thing that I want to talk about now is um, how we go from offshore PTHA through to onshore hazards. Um, while accounting for all these variable sources and uncertain earthquake frequencies. Okay, so this is mainly a computational challenge. Um, so these modern sort of offshore PTHAs include many, many scenarios. So in ours, the 2018 study, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of scenarios. Um, some of my colleagues in Europe, they have even many more. They've got about 10 million uh, in a, a, a offshore probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment for the Mediterranean and Northeast Atlantic. And so on top of that, you've got for each of these, we don't know how often they occur. So there's many alternative scenario frequency models. So how are we going to compute the onshore hazards then? Well, in principle, it's easy. Um, in principle, we make an inundation model for our site, and then we just model inundation for every scenario in the PTHA. And so that gives us, you know, depth, speeds, everything at the onshore site of interest according to a model. And then if we had that, we could compute the hazards just like we did in the offshore assessment and account for all the uncertainties and that'd be very nice. Unfortunately, that step two isn't normally computationally feasible, right? We can't simulate all these scenarios. Uh, this is some work here by my European colleagues and they have a, a GPU tsunami code where each scenario took about 25 minutes and they were able to simulate uh, tens of thousands of these using um, uh, very high performance computing, um, but still it's, it's nowhere near um, uh, every scenario in the PTHA. So in our case, if we look at my, my Greater Perth tsunami inundation model that I showed you earlier, this um, here, West, for this study, we simulate the tsunami for about 24 hours, and that takes about two and a half hours of wall clock time. So, you know, ballpark 10 times faster than, than real time. But that's using, you know, 288 cores of the Guardi supercomputer. So it's not really big scale HPC, but it's probably, you know, certainly more than you're likely to have at home. And so 
given our computational budget, let's say it's practical to simulate, you know, something around 400 scenarios. That, that This is way less than, you know, hundreds of thousands. So way less than every scenario in the, the PTHA. So we need something else. And that's something else. Um, very recently, we've started doing this in um, commonly. Uh, so is using Monte Carlo methods. So I'm not going to go into the detail, but basically the key thing is that Monte Carlo methods, this is a whole family of techniques. And it's about approximating result you would get from say doing all scenarios, but just using some random subset of scenarios. And so the advantages of these is, well, first of all, we don't have to simulate inundation for all scenarios because we can't, okay? And so that's, that's essential. The second great thing is that although they're approximation methods, the errors are really well understood. So we know that they converge towards zero as we use more scenarios. And we can also estimate them in practice, even just from some finite samples. So it, from a quality control perspective, that's really nice. And so we actually developed a novel variant of this for, for PTHA. And so the key idea behind our approach is that we leverage offshore PTHA wave heights to have a bit of a guess of which scenarios are going to be more important for the site of interest. And then we can better sample those and also focus on like more important earthquake magnitudes and do this in a way that doesn't introduce any bias and still has all the nice theoretical properties of uh, simpler Monte Carlo methods. A side effect of this is that the technique's also much more general for modeling, for dealing with uncertainties in source frequencies and propagating them onshore. Um, so yeah, not gonna go into details, but I, I think it's a quite nice technique. So for example, for Greater Perth in Western Australia, so we've got our offshore PTHA um, on the Sunda Arc. If we just look at the main source uh, near the Greater Perth area, we've got about 130 scenarios. And what we do is we Monte Carlo sample about 400 in a way that's optimized for the site of interest. And then we simulate all of those in detail, you know, going right down to that, that sort of uh, 11 meter resolution all, all throughout the Greater Perth area. And then we use Monte Carlo theory to estimate the inundation frequencies and what are the uncertainties in that. And so it's in a, in a rigorous way. Okay, so does it work? There's all sorts of checks that you can do to make sure this is behaving well um, and you know you haven't made a blunder and they're based on all sorts of comparisons with the offshore PTHA. So basically the idea with this technique is that in deep water far from the coast, your offshore PTHA should be pretty good and your results should be very similar. And so that, that gives you a way for testing that everything's working okay. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's many ways to do that. And we, we do that sort of thing extensively in, in applications. So here's an example of the onshore product, right? So we're, we're resolving inundation uh, right around the Greater Perth area. Um, so, but it's hard to see unless you zoom in. So here we, we zoom into sort of um, Southern Fremantle. And so um, one thing we can do then is estimate the, the frequency of inundation. So this map is showing that, you know, having red areas or obviously the sea is wet all the time or areas that could be inundated on average every century or more. And then going into things that are inundated less and less often. And by the way, this is using a conservative treatment of tides. So the actual values here are a bit more conservative than if we were um, uh, modeling tides in more detail. So um, now, I mentioned about how these earthquake secret frequencies are really uncertain. And so we, you might think, well, how do they affect the results? So we can do this. And this is really important because it gives you like a formal approach to being conservative in these analyses. Okay. You might think, oh, I want to account for the fact that maybe those big earthquakes happen and maybe a bit more often than we, we might think. And you can do that and do it in a systematic way. So we basically we can describe percentile uncertainties on, on our hazard results for whatever it is of interest. And, um, and then make use of that to, to kind of control the level of conservatism in a consistent way, but at different sites. So an example application of this, this is led by uh, my colleagues at DFIS in WA. Um, so uh, one problem is uh, to think about earthquake tsunami evacuation zones. So um, as I showed earlier, we have these uh, tsunami warnings and they apply to very large coastal zones. So you, and you basically all you, you know is in your polygon, you might have a marine warning or a land warning. 
So, so what happens if a land warning occurs? Well, the, um, the basic advice that's given in the absence of detailed modelling is, well, evacuate 10 metres up or one kilometre inland. And so there's clearly potential for better targeted zones. And so an, an approach to this, um, which my colleague Adrian Branikin is leading at DFES, is to basically take the initial zones from a probabilistic hazard model and make a bunch of really conservative choices in terms of the return period you look at and the uncertainties, you know? So then you get something like this yellow zone here and then fatten it out even more, okay? So you, you wanna, so this is still looking at the yellow zone here. So we wanna pick areas that are um, easier to communicate and maybe add buffers if we're not so sure in certain areas. And so, um, in gray here, what we're seeing is the result of the 10 meters up and one kilometer inland with some decisions about how far to go into estuaries. And you can see that, you know, here, even though we're being very conservative, that the yellow zone is quite conservative by design, but it's still much better targeted than this 10 meters up one kilometer inland rule. And so that's really important because it, it's going to be more practical to action in just a few hours. Okay. And, and so we can make things like this extensively in the areas where we're modeling inundation at high resolution. So greater Perth area in this case. All right. So um, we got there. And so basically I will just finish up at the key points, you know, tsunamis have heard, GA does stuff. Uh, tsunamis have happened in Australia. They've been a bit dangerous. We contribute to risk management in various ways. Um, our models, we've done a lot of testing and they can broadly match real tsunamis. The hazard assessments, we need hypothetical sources. And again, we do a lot of testing. Um, and we've got techniques for doing inundation hazard calculations that account for all this source variability and uncertainty, which is useful for being systematic about uh, conservatism. So yeah, um, thank you very much. I've nearly gone over time. And um, but happy if we have any time for questions, I can take them or else just send me an email. Thank you, Gareth, for that really comprehensive overview of tsunami science and the work that you're doing at, at GA. Really interesting. So thank you for that. I think um, uh, if we don't have any immediate questions in the chat. We are right on time, but as um, Gareth just noted, if you have a burning question, feel free to reach out to Gareth um, and I'm sure he'll enthusiastically provide a response. Um, again, great presentation. Uh, well done. And it's, uh, this week's seminar. I do want to make an announcement about next week's. So next week, the speaker in this session will be Dr. Anthony Budd, the program leader of the Minex Cooperative Research Centre. Uh, the MINEX CRC National Drilling Initiative is a world-class collaboration of geological surveys and researchers to undertake drilling in underexplored areas of uh, potential mineral wealth and provide a test bed for new mineral exploration technologies. So please join again uh, us next week at this time slot for Dr. Bud's seminar. Thank you again to Gareth for his talk today and thank you for all of you who have uh, joined and listened in. We'll see you uh, next week. Thank you.